glad you're here this morning. Let's begin with just a word of prayer as we get started. God, we just come before you today. We're just thankful for your word, and we're thankful for the work that you're doing in this church. And Lord, I just pray for each one here that as we listen to your word today, that you would just remind us as we go out into the world and as we approach the world, what we need to do and, and really how we need to be different and, and be contrasted to this world. And you've given us the ability to do that. You've given us the instruction and the power to do these things. And so I just pray you'd speak to us through your word today for each one that's here as well. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. You know, there's been a verse that's, that's kind of been stuck in my mind maybe for over a year. You've probably heard me say it, or I may have even shared it with you in a past message at some point, but it's in Matthew, and it's in chapter 24, where Jesus is talking about the end, and it's in verse 11, uh, beginning in verse 11, and goes to verse 13. I want to read it to you this morning. It says this, many false prophets will appear and will deceive many, and because lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, this person will be saved. I don't know why that's been in my mind the last year. I think it's because as we watch our world growing deeper into darkness and lawlessness, it's really easy to allow our minds and our hearts to really slip into that colorless, gray, dark, cold, isn't it? We've all been beaten down by the societal issues that are just constantly in front of us, the attacks. You know, we've faced our share of disappointments, I'm sure, as you've flip on the news. All you have to do is watch that for a little bit. Watch our leaders fail us in a lot of ways. Maybe it's the economy. You've probably been impacted by financial issues that it brings seemingly taking what we've worked hard to get. Now we've got to work twice as hard to get half of it, right? I sat down the other day for lunch. I was at home working on this, and I went upstairs to get something to eat, and I sat down to have a chicken patty sandwich. I have those frozen chicken patties. Am I the only one that likes these? Anybody else like these? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I like them. They're quick. They're easy. So I make this sandwich. I bite into that sandwich. I look down. I look over at my wife, and I said to her, I think the chicken patty is thinner than the last time I bought these. But of course, when I looked at the receipt, the price wasn't thinner, uh, you know, at all. <laughs> if anyone has been to a customer service facility, a restaurant business in the last year or so, maybe you've had to call tech support, it sure seems that there are a lot of people that are just unhappy. Have you caught this at all out in society? People coming through lines for service are just, people are irritated, employees are irritated, frustrated. There's just like a general disgruntledness sometimes it seems like you run into in the public and along with that, unfortunately, I've found that it seems that a lot of the young people that are working, and I see them working at these different places, they just don't seem very happy in their jobs. They just don't seem like they're enjoying what they're doing. You know, I have people who are very short with me as I've gone to some of these places. I've had some that literally didn't even speak to me when I checked out. They didn't even talk to me at all. They seemed annoyed that I was actually there buying something. And you know, if you've experienced that, you can probably testify to the fact that it does kind of take a toll on you as you navigate the world around us. You know, as you live and you breathe in these environments, the moments that someone goes the extra mile, shows the extra care, does something more than what they are obligated to do, that really jumps out, doesn't it? really stands out. Maybe even the things we used to say were the norm are now like the extra things, you know, like the special things. In fact, I would suggest that in a world of darkness, it's when you see those moments of color, they even seem brighter than they would have ever been in the past. Contrast brings out distinctions. You know, God has reminded me of that time and time again, as I've gone about through society to these different things, many times over the last year, after a disappointing experience, usually as I'm driving away, God has not only reminded me of that, but of something else. He remi His reminder usually takes the form of this. It says something like, you know, you really have no idea what that person's going through right now. And he's right. People living without him are constantly impacted by the darkness and the hopelessness of the world. They are living like us in a world where lawlessness and wickedness have caused the color to fade and their hearts have grown cold. And when I find myself frustrated about an experience or the kind of service I received and I have to be on guard of that coldness, 
Or when I watch that latest disappointment on the news, I find myself wanting to kind of become reclusive. Anybody else like that? You want to just kind of get away from the world. I just want to shut the world out because I start to feel it's cold and it's got a bitter bite to it. The very thing that Jesus warned me of when he spoke of the end, I find in this current world, it's manifesting itself in my own heart and mind at times. And it bothers me. Hopefully it bothers you. So what I need, and what I think we all need, the followers of Christ need, going forward is a fresh approach. A fresh approach to interacting with the people in the world. We need a fresh approach to the mission set before us as the people of God, and we really need a fresh approach on how we overcome and guard ourselves from the bitterness and the coldness that can creep in on the Christian in the midst of a dying, wicked world. So this morning, I just want to look at a few simple things that God has given us and shown us through Jesus that we must keep in mind and carry out that will have profound impacts on those around us and also help our spiritual lives to be insulated, protected, and continue to grow. You know, the first thing we need is we really need a fresh approach on interacting with the people in our world. We really do. Matthew 7 says this, beginning in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. They do not gather grapes from the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles, do they? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree is not able to produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree to produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As a result, you will recognize them by their fruits. As Jesus delivered that famous Sermon on the Mount, he mentioned that days would be coming when deception would become an even bigger problem than it was during his day. There was going to be people of influence with ability that would appear a certain way, but in reality, it was quite the opposite. And this would be a huge problem for those looking for leaders and role models and guides as they're trying to navigate life. Jesus warned us that in the coming days, trust would be hard to earn in the hearts of the people because the work of deception was going to be looming everywhere. There are consequences upon society when these types of things have been going on for as long as they have. When truth and honor and fact no longer universally revered by society and leaders, deception and hypocrisy start to take over. And so trust starts to turn to skepticism. You've probably been there, if you've been like me at all. When people start to see those over them, those around them, being self-seeking rather than selfless, they start to grow cold and untrusting. As I shared earlier, in fear of my own heart, the wickedness and evil of society leads people to be skeptics more than optimistic, doesn't it? We are more scrutinizers today because of what this world has become than we have ever been. And that, folks, as followers of Christ and workers in the Great Commission, is why our fresh approach must involve bearing good, fresh, and wholesome fruit in the midst of our society. Jesus told the disciples that day that in the midst of the deception that was coming, it would be the observable fruit that would make the difference. It would be the only thing in which they could use to determine the truth from a lie. Their words being received and the gospel's acceptance would be heavily impacted by what people saw them bear between the messages and the sermons. Between the church services, real life would attest to who they are, what they believe, and the God whom they served. It's important for us to remember that Jesus' approach to the Judean world and its towns and people were impactful 
because his words were met with real fruit. That was his approach. Now, this was in contrast to the Pharisees and the leaders who, as Jesus put it, these are his words, Matthew 23, they tell others to do something and they do not do it themselves. You know anybody like that? Just put the news on. They tie up heavy burdens and they put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing with their finger to move them. And they do all their deeds in order to be seen by people, for they make their phylacteries broad and make their tassels long. And they love the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by people. Jesus had a following because the fruit he bore coupled with the message he gave was so different and so much greater than what people saw the world bearing. People would listen to him as they saw him practice his grace and speak the truth toward the sinner and the outcast. Jesus' number one tool to gain an ear of people for the chance to reach them with the truth was the fruit that he bore. And so it should be with us, right? There's no shortage of bad fruit out there today. Would you agree? Many people in high places, these experts that they call themselves today, they rely not on the fruit they produce, to reveal their understanding and their knowledge of the truth and their character before people, they think their position by name alone warrants loyalty and trust. While they lack any revealing evidence of actual understanding. So we have been so inundated with this type of stuff in our world that nobody trusts anybody anymore. Nobody believes what they hear like they used to. In fact, I heard somebody tell me this week, you know, back when my grandpa was, you know, young, the news was the facts, right? No longer, right? The sacredness of an agreement through a handshake that was good in my grandpa's day has given way to stacks of paper with attorneys, right? I'm convinced that despite where people have been, And how the world has gone, they still long for the days of old. People still long to see good fruit produced on the trees of those around them. They intuitively know it when they see it. They're drawn to it. We all long to find those people who are as honest and real as the day is long, right? And we must remember that it's their fruit that reveals them. So what do those people around us in this world see when they look at our branches? Is there fruit on it that is separate from the rest of the rotten fruit in the world? Is it sweet to the taste? Is it refreshing to behold it? Our fresh approach in a dying world must be beautiful, rare, separate, fresh fruit. In many, if not most instances... Our effectiveness in reaching someone with Christ will heavily depend on what they saw when we didn't know they were looking at us. I can remember as a younger Christian working as a claim representative at a major insurance company, one of the absolute worst customers I ever had. Maybe, I mean, maybe the worst one. And it just so happened that this man had had his home broken into, and I got the claim on my desk. And so I called him to go over things. He, was, he lived right in our area. I knew right where he was at. And I said, I'll assure you I'm going to help you get this all taken care of. And I was met with one of the coldest, most difficult customers I encountered in a 10-year insurance career there. I dreaded calling this man when his case would come up for review or action on my desk. And it just so happens that after having handled that claim, my wife and I were going to a church in town. And that man who had made my work day so miserable was in fact an elder on the board of the church we were attending. We weren't at the church very long when I realized this. (laughs) The fruit we bear when we interact with our waiter, our waitress, the person at the window, at the bank, 
the customer service rep that you're on the phone with will be felt and seen. How we approach those around us in the day to day will either reveal a fresh fruit that's beautiful to behold and experience for that partaker, or it'll add to the darkness and the colorlessness of the world around us. And folks, this is our number one tool to reflect the character of Jesus into this world. It's dark right now. The Holy Spirit has reminded me many times and opened my eyes many times as I've gone through the line at Subway that the young person across from me is of infinite value to him. If the world is pressing on us with Christ so much that Jesus himself has to remind us to not grow cold, what must it feel like to go through the world without him? We've got to approach today's world and the people in it with fruit that stands out and reveals Christ. Paul makes it a point to tell us in Galatians 5, you guys have heard this verse, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Did you catch the last part there? Against such things, there is no law. They might be able to come in one day and outlaw that you can't share the gospel in public, which we'd find a way around. But they can never outlaw the fruit of God's spirit that will be seen growing on the branches of your life. See, the world and its confusion and darkness cannot stop Christ's spirit from being seen in the lives of his followers. However, we can suppress that spirit and limit that work and prevent him from being seen when we let the works of the flesh and the callousness of the cold creep in. Now, I made it a point when I get up here to only tell you what I'm learning to tell myself every day. Don't let the coldness of the world prevent the fruit of the Spirit growing abundantly on your tree. It's imperative people see that fruit as we live our lives so that through our lives and interactions with them, they can just catch a glimpse maybe of Jesus. And that glimpse may be all they need to say, I want to seek him out. That has to be a primary focus and an approach for us going forward. Secondly, along with the fruit we bear, we need a fresh approach to God's mission for us. For too long, churches in the West have become a hollow show and a consumer product. A pastor friend of mine who works with a ministry reaching and helping churches all across our area told me one time, most churches these days measure their success by the three B's, bucks, buildings, and bodies. As long as we have plenty in the bank, a huge campus, thousands of people were successful. Not true. Our approach, and Pastor Ray said this just a couple weeks ago, we must not be a mile wide and a millimeter deep. Considering we live now in a world even more abundant with skeptics, we need to know more of the word and what it means than we have ever known. We need to know why God said the things he did and be able to explain it to others. All of that means that we need to take action in our lives to know Jesus deeper and closer than we ever have before. You know, a Barna study I came across this week showed that 70% of the people they surveyed claimed to be Christians. And only 6% of those actually had a biblical worldview and were living lives that reflected it. 70% are Christian, 6% have fruit on the tree. Being a disciple of Jesus is not just someone who knows what he said, but someone who can reflect his character in the day-to-day -day life. If someone who exhibits that fruit and the understanding of who God is and what he desires, that's what we're looking for. See, in our society of deception and lies, we need to be growing as disciples after Christ so we can stand and reflect our Savior to a world that was designed by him. It will recognize him when they see it. 
Are we putting it out there? If we're going to accomplish anything in this current culture, we need to be more than attendees and paper-thin followers. We need churches who are making disciples, who are devoted and personally committed to seeking, imaging, and reflecting Jesus. Thirdly, we need a fresh approach to how we protect ourselves and overcome the coldness of heart that Jesus warned us would come with the wickedness and the lawlessness of the world. You know, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, right after the Beatitudes, Jesus says this, Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses, becomes tasteless, by what will it be made salty? It is good for nothing any longer except to be thrown outside and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on top of a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and place it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines in all those in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As a city on a hill looks out over the countryside, what happens to it when the lights in all the little towns and the homes and the villages in the valley start to go out? How important is the city on the hill and its light when it's the only place with the lights on that's left? It's the navigation marker. It's the point of rest. It's the source of information. It's the break in the darkness down in the valley. Folks, you and I, per Jesus, are those cities. As the darkness grows, your light for Christ is only growing more important and critical to the mission of Christ. Revelation 12 says this, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. To close, I just want to give you three quick things that I hope that you'll take with you at all times. These are the keys to approaching the cold world and coming out with joy and peace and fruit. Number one, we must approach our lives in the world with the blood of the lamb. When you've experienced the heartache of this world, there is only one thing that can get you through and bring healing. It's the hope and the assurance and life that comes with knowing Jesus. It's knowing that Jesus has defeated all these things by his blood on the cross and by his resurrection. And his offering, it to us free of charge, means hope doesn't have to be purchased. It can just be received. You don't have to pay twice as much for half the price with that, do you? The blood of Christ shed, washing us from our sin, and then his resurrection to prove his promise and that he has, in fact, overcome the world. John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have affliction, but have courage. It's my favorite part. I have conquered the world. If the fact that you can have a good and restored relationship <clears throat> with the ultimate conqueror, and authority of life and death, Jesus Christ doesn't give you hope, nothing's going to. When hopelessness swells around us, as we see panic on the faces of people who are trying to hold on to this world and its false promises, it is the blood of Jesus Christ that tells us that we can have joy. We are forgiven. We are promised a future and a kingdom without suffering and death and hypocrisy and false hope. It's real. Does that give you the fruit of joy on your tree when you hear that? I hope others will see it and they'll say, where does that come from? Number two, we must not fall in love with this world. It's really easy to do. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him because everything that is in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes and the arrogance of material possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away in its desire, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. It's important to remember when you read this, 
that the world was created by God and for his purposes for man to live, and we messed it all up. But the world is no longer defined as just the earth and nature and its beauty. The world has become fallen. It's the things of the flesh, the temporary promises and false promises. The Bible says there is a prince of this world, and it's not Jesus. Therefore, we must understand that John's instruction to not love the world is not telling us we shouldn't love the will of God going about in the day-to-day. -day. The things that God cared for, like loving your neighbors, your family, your wife, your husband, your children. We must have our ultimate hope and our love in that which is greater than anything in this world, and everything has to be subject to it, and that's the love of Christ. If we love the world, we'll serve the world. And Jesus doesn't allow for two masters, does he? If we love the world, we'll be hopeless when it starts to fail and come apart around us. Jesus' kingdom, he said, is not of this world, and it will have no end. As John said in Revelation, there are some who have fallen for this so much that they'll do anything to preserve their physical lives. They'll do anything to try to keep control because the world is their ultimate hope. And if it starts to slip away, they start to freak out. It's peace that comes with Jesus because we've made, been made new by him. We've been given new life. And we have an eternity. Do you realize that doesn't go away? It doesn't perish. It can't rot. Last thing, number three, our approach must be the word of our testimony. Not only is that testimony for others to hear so that they can have the hope that you have, but it's for you to remind yourselves in those difficult moments, a reminder, a testimony for what God has done for you in your life. Your testimony is pictures you and God have taken and hung on the walls in your mind so that you will never forget where you've been and how God has carried you, provided for you, and met you when you called on him. And that, folks, is the ever-present hope that resides within the believer. So when the cold starts to approach the door, you make sure not to let that in. My prayer today is that your approach to our days, to God's work, and to those around you will be fresh with good fruit from the Holy Spirit, it's your ministry through your daily interactions with those around you will be one of a good reputation for the kingdom of God, building trust among the skeptics. That your life and mine will be examples of Christ's character as we grow in understanding and application of his word. And I pray that we will keep ourselves focused and reminded every day of the gospel, our testimony because of it, and our relationships with Jesus. His promises and proven love will warm you enough that when the lawless and the wickedness of the world arrive, it'll keep the cold out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we just again thank you. That your word instructs us how to behave, how to act, how to protect ourselves, and how to do your will as we go about a world that seems to be growing darker and colder all the time. And so I pray, Lord, for each one here today that you would warm us by your spirit and that we would go out and we would bear fruit even in the midst of winter so that others will come to know you. They'll glorify you by the fruit that we bear. We thank you. You've given us the tools that you've redeemed us from sin so that we in joy and peace can go forth and bear fruit for you and for a kingdom that will not end. We thank you for those promises, and we pray that you would bless us, you would keep us as we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.